Okay, uh, we are live. Last episode we promised a video on dragons. We may have overestimated our ability to talk. Yeah, so obviously with dragons there's an awful lot to talk about. Um, we thought we could have just done, yeah, quick adventure, in and out, one hour, boom, <laughs> dragons covered. But yeah, there's a lot to talk about with dragons. You know? Yeah, there's um, the new gemstone dragons, chromatic, metallic, there are the various gods... They're a key part of D and D, and they've been expanded on and iterated on many times. Yeah, and the, the lore and the history just goes so 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 deep with them. The role playing options go so deep with them. You know, people can base entire campaign and story arcs just off of these creatures alone. And there's so many different options and ways to play them that yeah, there's not. We we wouldn't be able to do dragons justice by just rattling through everything in a single episode. So I think today we're going to primarily just do a little introduction to dragons and, yep. and talk about uh, chromatic dragons. Yeah, that's what I prepare, chromatic dragons. Yeah, um, um, which are inherently the, the the evil, big bad, evil dragons of, of your campaign and your encounters. I've got a couple of points here. They're, so they're always evil aligned. Chromatic dragons are defined by the fact that they're evil aligned. Mm. They are, by personality, egotistical. They have, like, a god complex. They think that they're all-powerful. And they're greedy, almost, like, for the sake of greed. Yeah. They are... They have uh, dangerous layers. Um, they're in Fizzbass Treasury of Dragons. There's some great um, dungeons you can just drop into your campaign. It's showing the different types of dungeons that chromatic dragons would have. Yeah, uh, and a big thing with dragons as well, they have got that that ego to them. Yep. They have got that ego, so that, that that ego spills into not just their personality, but their what they surround themselves with, their, their horde, their appearance, their lair as well. Um, so whenever you're thinking about dragons, you got to think about everything around the dragon and everything that that dragon surrounds itself in. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be covering the, 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 the evil versions of these these dragons. But before we get too much into, into the chromatic dragons, I think we should talk a little bit about, you know, why, why, why do you think dragons are, are the quintessential, you know, poster child of, of Dungeons and Dragons? You know, why not like Dungeons and Warlocks or Dungeons and Goblins? It's, it's hard to say. There, there's just like a, a bit of a lore that like real life lore associated yeah. with dragons where they're they appear seemingly almost independently of each other in different cultures around the world I, I find that so so interesting like you can go into pretty much any civilization's folklore or mythology and you're going to find some form of dragon and even if you just boil it down to let's say the 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 british isles mm. you know ireland scotland wales and england they you four places very close together all have their own four individual dragon mythologies and, and folklore wales for example has a dragon on its flag it, it's its national flag scotland has nessie which is a big serpent-like creature england uh patron saint saint george famous for killing a dragon man you know even ireland's got its own mythological folklore dragon olifalant or something along those lines do you know uh, wales is not the only country to have a dragon on its flag Oh, uh, oh, let me guess, let me guess. It's not Mexico. They got no. this eagle type no. thing. Oh, give me a please. What, what part of the world? What country? Asia. A of course it's Asia. Uh, well, it's not China. No. It's not Taiwan. It's not Japan. It's not Korea. It's North or South. I don't know. It's Bhutan. But uh, you say I never would have got that. <laughs> I never would have got that. I want to have to actually get a wee picture of this here. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like it, they got this like red and orange sort of thing background with um, a dragon. It's pretty cool. That's that's awesome. So yeah, yeah, that probably answers the question of why it is Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons are such a quintessential part of. Dragons have been told in stories for thousands and thousands of years. Not just you know in the eighties when Gary Gygax decided I'm making a game. Let's let's include dragons. That wasn't just uh, blindly thrown in there. It's, that's Dragons have been a part of human history and storytelling since since before the time of even the Bible, mm -hmm. and, and 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 in fact, a, a seven-headed dragon shows up in the Old Testament. Believe it or not, <laughs> even the Bible has dragons. I'm not going to touch too much into that there, in case it gets uh, yeah, too cool. religious. But Bible even the, study. even the Bible's got dragons. You know, it's 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 nuts. It's it's absolutely crazy. Um. And, and, and when you look into it, you can kind of see the reasons as to 
why it is Dungeons and Dragons, not just because uh, not just because it starts with the letter D, like Dungeons. <laughs> yeah, D and D just sounds so good. Yeah, D and D sounds way better. You know, you know, <laughs> like what other what other creatures do you think could fall out in realistically for Dungeons and Dragons? What, what what do you think could replace a dragon as the poster child? Oh, I, I mean, to me, like my favorite monster of all time, I think is the Mind Flare. I think that comes close. I think Mind Flares are really good. Yeah, a really good sort of second runner-up mm. in terms of that. Maybe a Beholder as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe a Beholder, but it's just because they're such a they are unique to Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. That's a very you'll see that and you think Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. you know. Whereas you see a dragon, you don't necessarily think Dungeons and Dragons. They could just be any enough. generic fantasy. Yeah, dragons are born, man. You know, although they say that uh, we're, we're going to need at least four different episodes to cover all these <laughs> dragons. You know. <laughs> Uh, I've just got up this picture of the Bataan flag as well. That's one of the most badass national flags I've ever seen. I love the idea of like all of these flags at the UN. You got the, you know, the the United States flag. You got the British flag. You got all of those really regal flags from loads of history in them. Yeah, Bataan. Just we got a kick-ass looking dragon there, you know. And that dragon's got a bit of like, you know, badass. And it's like as an well. Eastern influence dragon. It's more of a serpent, probably. Yeah, than, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no wings or anything. It's kind of like. Um, it's also breathing fire as well, which yeah. is just badass. You know? Yeah, just badass. That's the kind of that's, that's, that's yeah. the kind of national flag I could get into. One of the mistakes I made when I was first encountered a dragon is I assumed that all dragons breathe fire because that's the only, oh yeah. yeah yeah definitely yeah that was the only um, that was the only touchstone that I had for dragons. I just assumed they all breathe dragon breathe fire, and I remember the first time some uh, the DM uh, used a dragon breath attack against me. I was like. What do you mean it's not fire? Yeah. What do you mean it's poison? <laughs> I think we actually have the same yeah. dragon encounter. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. like, my biggest takeaway from the first time I ever encountered a dragon, which was the same as yours, was, yeah. holy shit, this dragon can talk. Yeah. I thought it was just going to growl. I thought it was a big, lumbering, angry, hungry creature that just seen little tiny things and thought, oh, food. No, 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 no. This was a mm -hmm. smart and vastly, and way more intelligent than any of us. Yeah. You know that that had goals and 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 drive and you know motives, uh, and that was a big takeaway. Realizing that I could just have a conversation with the dragon. No, this was a green dragon, so it didn't go too well. No, this was um, <laughs> Venom Fine. Yeah, I looked it up. Um, Venom Fine is the the dragon from the. Um, the Lost Minds of Fandelver campaign, yeah. which was our first foray into D&D &D. I'd imagine that was a lot of people's first yeah. encounter with the dragon as yeah. well and I'd imagine that took a lot of people by surprise because mm -hmm. uh, another topic that we'll be covering in this is layers mm -hmm. and even just the, the build up to finding that dragon, you're going through this abandoned village that has just been dilapidated and destroyed and you're asking yourself this question the entire time like, why, is this, why is this village dilapidated and destroyed and you know, lo and behold, it's because a dragon has decided to reside there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, that's, that's a little bit about what I wanted to talk before we get into the nitty gritty of what chromatic dragons are. Um, you know, covered already a bit of vexology, a little bit of <laughs> folklore, a little bit of mythology. So, enough about the real world now. Let's let's get into the the nitty gritty of what a chromatic dragon is. You know, where do they come from? What motivates them? Yeah, so there's five key chromatic dragons as presented in the Monster Manual. Mm. There's black, blue, white, green, red. And those five colours would represent the five heads of Tiamat. Mm -hmm. Who, we'll touch on that one later on. Yeah. I'm sure some of you have already heard of Tiamat, but uh, we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover that later on. So we'll go through them in um, alphabetical order. So first up is black dragons. They are said to be the most evil of chromatic dragons, the, the most evil aligned uh, of the chromatic dragons. They're more of like a chaotic kind mm -hmm. of evil as well, you know? Yeah. Uh, For, which is strange, because like, somehow chaotic evil feels more evil than lawful evil, if that makes sense. Mm. Even though they're both evil. Well, lawful evil tries to justify itself. Mm. Chaotic evil doesn't try to put a pretty yeah. picture on it. Chaotic evil's like, this is evil, I know it's evil. I'm not going to try and lie to you, you know. Yeah, so uh, black dragons make their homes in bogs, fans, and swamps that are in ruined keeps. Mm. So, yeah. I like to think of uh, a good way of distinguishing a black dragon from, let's say, a red dragon is a red dragon would be like a politician, you know, lawful mm. evil. They're going to pretend like they got the best sort of 
you know, they, they, they might be pretending like they could help or pretending. They have this facade on mm. them anyway. Uh, whereas a black dragon would be much more like a mobster boss, you know. They're not even going to pretend like they're remotely good. They are chaos incarnate, mm -hmm. which can be really, really fun to role play as well. Mm -hmm. Just allowing the DM to really just flex their evil kind of, yeah. you know, hopes and dreams. So one of the distinctions that it's in the books is the type of things that these chromatic dragons obsess over and collect. Mm -hmm. So for black dragons, they like to collect sentient artifacts. So like magical... Uh, like magic swords that are like have life have a, a, a body within them basically mm -hmm. um, and they also like to collect creatures so things like kobolds and lizard folk that act as their minions yeah so what about like a genie lamp of that kind I'm not sure you know they, they'd really? probably be interested I think everyone wants a genie lamp yeah I would be terrified of a genie lamp that would, that would only go one way with me it would be bad <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible yeah uh. um they also like to collect like vestiges and mementos of fallen empires. So they have this kind of like god complex where they like to outlive empires. Mm -hmm. Obviously, dragons are very long lived, from you know they span up to over eight hundred years old, you know, mm. or five hundred years old, and that's how old ancient yeah. dragons are. There's a whole life cycle to dragons. There's a whole um, upwards trajectory, and true dragons are said to be immortal. Mm. They can be slain, but they can't die of old age. Yeah, kind of like a jellyfish <laughs> and a <laughs> sure. lobster. Sure. Um, so yeah, they like to collect mementos of fallen empires. Just they like to have outlived things. Mm. Um, so their layer action. So every chromatic dragon uh, that is powerful enough will have a layer, and in its layer, it'll have layer actions. It uh, has three things: you can surging pools of water swarms of insects or can create magical darkness mm. so what what form of damage is this dragon primarily then um yeah so their ass their their actual breath attack is an acid attack mm. not fire not fire not fire which is a mistake i'm sure most new players of dungeons and dragons have made before um, and their layer like what kind of what kind of layer are we talking about is it up in the mountains is it so they're 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 in like boggy lands, peats, marshes, um, swamps, basically, um, where they have like ruined keeps where it's like it's waterlogged and uh, it's all covered covered in ivy and moss, and mm. that's the sort of aesthetic they're going for. Yeah. And then lastly, in Black Dragons, I have the regional effects. So this is the dragons are so like magically innate innately magical that their presence in an area will change and warp mm -hmm. the area uh, in time so they um, the land within six miles um, of the black dragon's lair is considered difficult terrain due to thick plant growth and the reeking mud the water within a mile of the lair is magically foiled and there is fog for six miles around the mm. layer. That's such an interesting way of actually distinguishing just how powerful these creatures are. Mm. You know, it's not just a this is a big, massive, beat stick kind of a boss that will hit hard and and has a big health pull. No, simply just by existing in an area, these things affect the the land around them without even needing to try. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, imagine being that powerful that that you have your own. You, you have an actual incremental effect on on the weather, on the on the lands, and, and everything. Um, and it's just one of those like things that are unexplained, mm. and it sort of adds to the mystery and the mystique of dragons. Yeah, and it it, it sort of ties in like their relationship with na with uh, magic and, mm. and the material plane as well. Dragons are inherently magical beings. But not in the sense of like wizards who need to study it or anything. More so like sorcerers, I suppose maybe that they're they're born with this innate magic. You know, they're they're tied to the the the, the magic in the material plane, and um, they don't even need to try for this stuff. They just radiate this 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 immense power yeah. that that just you know can change land masses. Yeah. I mean, while we're on, we may as well talk about it. So dragons can be innate spellcasters. Mm. Um, Fizzbound's Treasury of Dragons does an interesting thing where it shows, gives examples of the kinds of spells that different types of dragons would have access to. Mm. So based on their alignment and what sort of things they, they find interesting, different spells will be a bit available to them. Yeah. Um, I could look up the black dragon ones, but it, 
Uh, yeah, take too much. <laughs> so that's everything I have for Black Dragons. Any closing thoughts? Um, not in particular. I've never had the priv- privilege of playing one or the awful experience of having to fight one before. Yeah, I've I've created an encounter with a black dragon where it was this like keep with a giant moat, and there were these underground passageways, and I was going to have the dragon sort of just fly in, breath attack, fly out, or mm. you know, sort of like dive into the underground there uh, areas. But the idea was that this like keep was going in this like sort of marshy keep was going to be its lair, and the players wouldn't know that until they got there. Mm. Um, that was sort of my idea. I'd never got the run out, but I still have it in my back pocket in case either one of one shot someday. <laughs> mm. It's fun to have a few little uh, things I like get in your back pocket. I got a couple of fun encounters with like beholders, or, or you may have one with an elder brain somewhere in the back pocket, just to throw it out. You know, if, if a group of players annoy me enough, you know. Uh, so that's black dragons. Next alphabetically is blue dragons. So blue dragons are really cool. They um, their terrain is like desert environments. They like to soar high above deserts using height to translate into speed, which it then unleashes uh, its lightning breath to attack traveling caravans or settlements. Mm-hmm. So it, I forget the name of that, but it's like a dog. It's like there's like dog fighting. There's turn and burn, and there's another term for using your uh, height into speed and then flying away with that speed. Oh, it kind of like acting as a dive bomb in a yeah, way. Yeah, like a dive yeah. bomb. Yeah, like that's mm. that's the sort of um, a, uh, the strategy they go for. Well, you'll actually see uh, falcons and things utilizing those mm. those uh, those strategies in real life to to attack prey. Um, so uh, personality wise, they're notoriously vain. They will not stand for any remarks, calling them weak. Mm. Which I mean, I, I feel like goes for most. Dragons, but this just it happens to be particularly uh, pl- applicable for this dragon. Yeah, they have a short temper. Yeah. Imagine that way. You call a black dragon weak. They might be. They're probably not that bothered about what you think. Mm-hmm. Whereas a blue dragon, they they care about what people think of them. Mm-hmm. They, your opinion will affect them. They won't get upset about it. They'll just get angry about it. Uh, which should try not to annoy the big blue dragon. Try not to annoy dragons in general. It's a bad yeah. idea. Um, the next part is that they're desert predators. So, like, when you're when you're thinking about including a dragon in your campaign, you sort of have to imagine them as being part of the ecosystem. Mm. And they're not just like a monster that appears in a dungeon. You know, they they exist in the world. They will have hunting grounds. They will be known to people. Uh, and for that, um, I've got it written down that they use their lightning breath to cook herds of uh, of migrating animals through <laughs> deserts. So they use their lightning breath to like sear and like cook. Mm. I'm just imagining. Oh yes, that's a uh, medium well. <laughs> well, <laughs> I like that. There, they aren't uh, barbaric. Uh, again, it reflects like the intelligence of these creatures as well. He doesn't want his 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 goats raw. He wants them done at a nice, you know, sous vide type temperature. And with using his own breath, he can control the heat directly. So why doesn't the dragon deserve a nice, uh, well cooked piece of meat? You know. <laughs> Uh, that was an interesting thing you touched on there. Of um, you, these dragons will affect their ecosystems. People in the region are going to know them, and these dragons can have a huge influence not only just in the in the local area that is their lair, but on the entire like country or even continent sometimes as a whole. Um, the influence of a dragon can can span you know hundreds and hundreds of miles to multiple cities. Yeah. You know, all over. If you ever want to like hint a dragon, you can even have rumor tables where things like uh, uh, every like uh, top villager, when sending someone off on their way, says something like "Be careful of the night," mm. which sounds very ominous, and it could just be in reference to a black dragon that the villagers called the night or something like that. You know, you can't include it in in like tables like that because these dragons will be known to mm. the locals of that area. Yeah, you don't need to be too on the nose with. Uh teasing a dragon either a little bit goes a long way sometimes one of my favorite ways of uh hinting at a dragon is not actually saying the players see it but the players are just out wandering you know somewhere off on a random quest and all of a sudden they'll hear a distant sound of like a whip cracking Mm -hmm. and it's quite uh rhythmic you Mm -hmm. know happens every couple of seconds and then slightly louder they'll hear another whip sound Mm -hmm. And another whip sounds slightly louder, and then it'll slightly go off the distance. But this dragon is is like 10, 15 miles away, mm. and the players won't be able to see it, but 
the sheer size of the dragon's wings flapping will create this you know, sound barrier breaking mm. whip sound and it's just a cool way of like adding that layer of mystery and, and, and dropping little clues as to what might be going on you know the players don't know that it's going to be a dragon but they hear, hear they hear it you know so the next thing in my notes is that um, blue dragons are highly social and they like to collect and be the overlord of living creatures mm -hmm. that it like pays so things like bards sages artists wizards and assassins which are sort of like its minions. So, you know, black dragons have kobolds and lizard folk. Blue dragons have sort of adventurers almost that it keeps under its wing. Mm -hmm. Which sort of like in my head sort of sparks the idea of you are an adventuring party owned by a blue dragon and you're sent off to do its bidding. Yeah. That, that's, that could be a cool idea. That's a cool, that'd be cool. And the DM could be the blue dragon, mm -hmm. you know? That's a, that's, that's, that's a cool <laughs> concept. Um. So as far as like uh, material wealth they like to hoard gems especially blue gems like sapphires that makes, makes sense yeah makes sense. makes sense yeah so their layers this is probably my favorite part of blue dragons they use their lightning breath to crystallize sand into tunnels um and which sort of like leads to these like sort of giant sprawling underground mm -hmm. like systems so um, you can imagine adventurers are coming across it and if they haven't encountered a blue dragon before they wouldn't know what this means mm. I'm kind of visualizing uh, I don't know if you've played it Dark Souls I haven't played it. but there's a dragon and that so happens to be about the same color as blue but he's called Seif mm -hmm. and he is trying to become immortal through this process called crystallization and he's got this big underground cavern that he's formed himself out of crystals so anybody listening if you play Dark Souls Try and picture Seif's, uh, Seif's, Seif's dungeon there. That'd be very similar to what blue dragons are going for with crystals. I just realized something. Do you remember before the, camp, the part of the campaign started, we talked about the, the guy who commented the letter E? Yes. That was the answer to the riddle. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so if you're listening and you uh, watch oh the last God, episode... That's so wait, I'm just, <laughs> oh, that's so Oh, so annoyed at that. <laughs> We, we were talking before the, uh, the podcast started about that, and I was really confused what the comment meant. And then I realized that during the podcast, we yeah. had a riddle yeah. where the answer to the riddle was the letter E. So if you're that guy in the comment section, congratulations. I'll go back and give you a little heart or whatever. That's so... So, yeah, before this podcast started, <laughs> there was one comment left, and we were both baffled. We were like, is he just a master troll? Like, like what does this mean? <laughs> just the letter E. And uh, congratulations on, on getting the answer to the, to the riddle as well. I completely forgot that. Bit. I completely forgot. At least we know someone's listening, you yeah, know. At least someone listens. Oh, that's so annoying. Congratulations, though. Yeah. You win a... You win a, a, a like from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything to give you. Unfortunately, pretty low budget. But the last that's the most legendary subscriber we're ever going to have. But, um, <laughs> So the last, I lost sleep over that. <laughs> the last thing about layers I want to talk about is the fact that blue dragons know like the weak points of the tunnels and can collapse the entire layer in on adventures when they uh, come in to try to fight it. And uh, blue dragons have a um, have a, a like a, a digging speed, mm. so they can like just dig up to the surface and then fly away. But do you imagine like adventurers trapped under like a couple of like miles of desert? Yeah. Terrible, ter ter absolutely terrifying. Yeah. It blows my mind that dragons have some dragons have that digging speed of what is it like thirty feet? Mm. Uh, I th 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 it up. Thirty feet. Like the idea of something that massive. It's called burrow. And it's burrow. forty. It's forty feet. For forty ancient. feet. Yeah. And the idea of something going just that fast underground is absolutely terrifying. So it's between fifteen and forty feet, depending on the age of the blue dragon. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely horrifying. So they're not just menaces above ground, but, but even underground as well. Um, uh, the last two things I want to talk about is the layer actions and the regional effects. Mm -hmm. So the layer action is what we just discussed, uh, a collapse of the ceiling. Uh, the second one is a cloud of sand, and the third is an arc of lightning. Yeah, so like an arc of lightning that sort of like gaps between like a rock into like a wall, maybe like cutting through uh, a person to mm. find the path of least resistance. Yeah. Sort of like the the power of the, the magic just inherent within the dragon sort of causes these effects to happen. I like the idea of uh, these arcs of lightning happening continuously almost mm. in the layers between different 
crystals. Mm. So it, it, you have this big, huge cavernous area, and that can seem a little bit boring of an arena. But then, if you utilize that dragon's, you know, vanity, which it's obviously going to have its own crystals up, mm-hmm. you can have that there lightning bouncing between these uh, different crystals sporadically. You, you can imagine even combat. like an aura of like sparks of lightning mm. sort of jutting out from a powerful dragon. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like an anime or something where they have these auras of like power to show how powerful mm. they are. I kind of like uh, Lady of Godzilla whenever he's charging up his, his, his mm. hyper breath. I don't mm. know what they call it in Godzilla. I'm not really that big a fan of it. I haven't watched that much of it. But one thing I do know is when he charges up his breath his uh, scales on his back start to glow this cool neon blue color mm-hmm. and it just looks so badass mm-hmm. uh, and, and dragons could have that there going as well so that's the layer actions and there's also regional effects that we talked about with the black dragon so mm-hmm. there's obviously thunderstorms there are dust devils which are basically just restarted air elementals and there are sinkholes sinkholes classic sinkholes Ugh. the things you were told to worry about as a child and then never happened <laughs> yeah I had such an irrational fear of sinkholes <laughs> That and volcanoes for some reason. I was always terrified of volcanoes. That's pretty much everything I have on Blue Dragons. Any last comments? Um, Nothing in particular. I think you pretty much covered the gist of it there, yeah. Okay, next is Green Dragons. We talked about Green Dragons before when we talked about Venom Fine from... Yeah, Green Dragons will always hold a special place in my heart because it was the very first dragon I've ever got to to encounter. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the first dragon a lot of people probably encountered yeah. for the first time. At least, you know, people have gotten into it in the last five, ten years. Mm-hmm. Um, Venom Fang, yeah. So, uh, green dragons are notorious for having cunning, misdirection, and trickery. They're almost like the trickery domain cleric version. <laughs> you know, they're, they're almost like an archfey in the way they try to, like, twist mm. your words and make you agree to things that you didn't mean to. Yeah, they're like the low key of dragons. I like the idea of uh, green dragons being the ones that uh, polymorph themselves and like people who are in position of power, you know, like mm-hmm. rich bankers and things, and, and can actually influence the political outlook of a of a city or a kingdom. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of uh, if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. there's this character in it. I cannot remember the name of him for the life of me. Something tongue in it. Worm tongue. Worm tongue, yes. Yeah. I love the idea of him being like a green dragon esque character. <laughs> Just this sniveling, weak, perceived character, but has so, so much influence just because they are the one whispering into the king's ear. Yeah. I love the idea of that being a green dragon and playing a green dragon that way. And then you finally call him Worm Tongue out his bullshit, and then boom, green dragon in front of you. Deal with that. <laughs> Yeah, some some metallic dragons can turn into humanoids. Mm. That's not a, an ability of most um, chromatic dragons. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. It's almost exclusively metallic. I think some of the most mm. powerful of the chromatics can. Well, I mean, it's your campaign. You can have. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I'm the DM. I make the rules. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could just say, like, if you wanted any canon reason, you could say mm. this dragon knows polymorph. Dra- chromatic dragons are probably too vain as well to want to try and pretend to be a weak yeah. little creature as well. You know. So, uh, green dragon layers are covered in ivy in the center of ancient forests. Mm. You can, they're, they're the sort of dragon that you would probably most encounter in, like, the Sword Coast on the Forgotten Realms, where they're this sort of, like, you imagine, like, in the sort of traditional Europe land medieval fantasy yeah. world that we all play in. Huge, dense rainforests. Huge rainforests, mm. but also just, like, oak, oak groves mm. and um, just sort of sycamore trees. Like, you can just imagine... Uh, big uh, forest where people go to hunt deer mm. and um, hide from society. <laughs> yeah, a squirrel can travel, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of miles without needing to touch the ground. There's that many trees. So green dragons hunt humanoids, especially elves, from the air and from the ground. Do you think it's because elves also primarily live in forested areas sense. as well? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it mentions that they particularly like the taste of elf flesh, so that could be a factor. It could also just be the fact that elves do live in forests. Well, mm. What elves live in forests? So. Yeah, and is it is it is it just elves, or would they happily eat other woodland creatures as well, like bears and and things like that? Yeah, so it says they, they can consume things like shrubs and small trees if they're hungry enough, but their favorite prey is elves. I love the idea of a vegetarian dragon. <laughs> I love the idea of a vegetarian one. Um, so they're, um, they're known to attack without provocation, especially if there's any threats to its territory. Mm-hmm. So if you show up to its lair or you show up to um, its uh, sort of like 
area of the, the forest, it will just attack you. Yeah, more of a more of a eat first, ask questions. It's a rock kind of thing, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then it also has um, servants. So, like we've talked about with the previous dragons, stuff like goblinoids, ettercaps, ettons, kobolds, uh, a wide variety of sort of woodland creatures. Or kobolds, man. Orcs and yuanti. Um, it, they also like to corrupt good aligned creatures, especially elves. So that's how evil they are. They mm. try to corrupt the good aligned creatures. That's a that's a really cool concept, actually. I've, I've, any any experience I have playing dragons, it's always just been the dragon itself, mm. and and that can be a, a really interesting way to make your dragon feel like a big bad evil guy. Yeah. They have an army of creatures underneath them that they can manipulate. So um. I've never played it, but I have watched a lot of videos on it. Fourth edition D and D. It had this thing called a minion, which was the same stats as a normal creature, but it had one hit point. Okay. So it was sort of like to make players feel powerful as yeah. they sort of slashed and cut their way through to try to reach the boss monster. Mm. And I feel like something like that could be implemented in fifth edition to try to um, add um, stakes and add variety to a dragon encounter mm. as I said you have all these different creatures like Ettons and adder caps and goblinoids that could just be like window dressing for the, mm. for the green dragon yeah so their favorite treasure is living sentient creatures particularly ones that are noteworthy so things like heroes sages and bards which that's, is, that's that's a cool way of uh, of, of valuing a treasure yeah. board yeah they do like material treasures like emeralds, carvings, instruments, instruments, and like musical instruments mm-hmm. and sculptures. So they do collect things like that as well. God, I'd be so disappointed if I was in the venturing party and we spent, you know, a, a three, four hour combat session taking out this dragon, getting all excited of yes, the best part of killing any dragon. You get to loot its hoard, and then we found out. Oh, it's just a fruity bard in a cage. <laughs> Damn. You'd be a little bit disappointed. You'd be a little bit disappointed. You'd be happy you saved them, but at the same time, where's my loot, man? You know, where's my loot? Um, so uh, one thing that was mentioned in the Monster Mind, which I found interesting, was that it sort of talks about how the the environment, the like typical habitat for green dragons can sometimes overlap with other colours of chromatic dragons. Mm-hmm. And it can lead to fights between dragons. So things like Arctic taigas, it can overlap with white dragon territory, or marshy woods can overlap overlap with black dragon territory. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> chromatic dragons, they typically wouldn't get along with other chromatic dragons then, yeah. you know? Not just metallic dragons and gemstone dragons, they don't like any form of other dragons. Yeah, so, it, I mean, th- there is some of this bit that said they're all evil, they're all evil aligned, so, and they're mm. all dragons, so they should have something uh, to relate to each other about, but the... Um, the the fact that they're all so vain and like self obsessed and egotistical means that they probably wouldn't trust or be trusted by other dragons. Yeah, if I was an asshole, I wouldn't trust other assholes. Mm-hmm. You know, um, imagine it's quite a lonely life for them. And the last two things I'll talk about was the layer actions and the regional effect. So the layer actions are grasping vines, a wall of vegetation. It's kind of like a wall of force, but flavored, and magical fog. So that's the same as the mm-hmm. the blue dragon, the fog. Yeah. No, it was the black dragon, the fog. Yeah. Mm. And then the regional effects uh, are a labyrinth of vegetations um, that green dragons leave no trace while within one mile of their lair, and that rodents birds are the ears and eyes of the dragon. So that that's kind of like I know you haven't played Curse of Strad, but there's a, a running theme that everyone is watching you because mm-hmm. of the number of minions that Strad has. So even like crows perched up on a, on a tree. yeah, I was gonna say kind of like Odin's crows. Yeah, uh, you're always being watched. You know, mm-hmm. there's a big brother kind of vibe yeah. there. You know, CCTV everywhere. That's all my notes for Green Dragon sound games. I love the idea of. Uh, <laughs> All of those CCTV cameras and stuff you see when you go out and about, it's not actually the government watching you, it's a big dragon, you know? Dragon watching you. Have you seen the have you seen the birds aren't real conspiracy theory? Uh, I've I've heard something about it, yeah. <laughs> Is that where like birds are just actually little robots yeah. that are monitoring people? Yeah. yeah, I heard something about that there. Yeah, it was, it and was, I was just thinking to myself, I'm not gonna read this because that sounds way too cool yeah. for the real world, you know. It's it's um it was actually a joke. 
it was like a, a meme that this guy created. Mm. He started getting people to like pretend to be in on it. Was this Reddit? Or was I this don't 4chan? know. I don't remember. It sounds like Reddit behavior. <laughs> yeah, it sounds Reddit behavior. But like some of those conspiracies, they annoy me because they just they make the real world seem so much more interesting than it actually is. The idea that the world's actually run by a bunch of lizards? Mm. That's badass, badass. That's <laughs> so cool. But let's be honest. It's not true. We're real world's way too boring for that there. But we're not talking about conspiracies. It's a whole other podcast. Yeah, go find someone else. This yeah. is D&D. There's plenty of po- conspiracy podcasts out there, for sure. Uh, probably barred on most platforms, but you'll find them. Uh, next, I want to talk about red dragons. The, the the bread and butter of what a dragon is in D&D. Let's be yeah. honest here. When know? most people who haven't played D&D think of a dragon, they probably think of a red dragon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 it, it, it's the quintessential thing about a dragon is, you know? Red and scary, and it breathes fire. Yes. You know, it just breathes fire, which is just cool. You know, so they mostly live in mountains and badlands. Uh, they, which sometimes competes with copper dragons for mm-hmm. their um, location. Um, when angered, they go into impulsive and destructive rages. So they're you can sort of imagine red being like fiery temper and like impulsivity. Uh, I also have that they see themselves as superior to all and the ruler of all, and they also see themselves as Tiamat's chosen. Mm. So they think that they are like the best. Yeah, they have a total belief in and in, in their in their own abilities and stuff, and rightfully so. They are terrifying creatures, mm. absolutely terrifying creatures. Even even the smaller black dragons, you know, like the young ones. Mm. They, they at all levels they are horrifying creatures, mm-hmm. and they're just that little bit more scarier than than the rest of the of the chromatic dragons. So next, I want to talk about creatures that red dragons use as informants, messengers, and spies. So th- this is a different thing that we were talking about earlier that we thought that it was like a unique way to introduce a car- a, a dragon as a mm-hmm. villain in a world and it makes them seem more real if they have an impact and if they have followers yeah these are essentially like demigod like beings it makes sense that uh, people and creatures will gravitate towards them and, and, and worship them as so mm-hmm. and like people are pretty used to kobolds being underlings for dragons but you can also imagine like a cult mm-hmm. worshipping like evil dragons could be um, just people who interact with the world and are like vast vestiges, vassals for mm. the dragon and sort of represent them in like society because this yeah. the, the dragons do exist in the world of Dungeons and the Dragons and their influence is felt across the land. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 a common trait for a dragon to, to be able to, once you reach set levels of power, not just have a have a impact on villages and cities, but over entire kingdoms and sometimes continents. Mm. Um, and and it, it just makes sense that uh, they they would have underlings to do the the roles and the jobs they may not necessarily want to do. A dragon is this mighty godlike creature. They're not going to want to do the simple jobs like influence and. Uh, politics in a court or mm. something like that. They're going to have people underneath them to do those jobs for them. Mm. I, I would even believe they will have kobolds as, as janitor roles to make sure that their their caves or their dungeons or wherever it is they may reside are, are clean and sparkly. They're going to need someone to clean all that gold. They can't <laughs> they can't keep that hoard clean themselves. You know? Speaking of the gold, um, one interesting thing I was reading in the Monster Manual is that red dragons are said to know the providence and the value of every item in their hoard. So every magic item, every gold piece, they know where it came from and they mm. know how much it's worth, which is really interesting. So they have like a database in their head for all the little gold pieces they keep yeah. track of. Red dragons are autistic. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Yeah. I can say that. <laughs> you can say that, though. You can say that. Yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. Uh, a really cool uh, thing I'd like to touch on with dragon horns as well is... Uh, where the, the, the treasure and things can be, where their origin may be from, for mm-hmm. example, like say they have this chalice and it's from a different plane, mm-hmm. the dragon will know that. Mm-hmm. And not just necessarily know that, but they will be able to learn information about that plane 
based off of uh, that chalice. So they don't know, like the history behind it. Say the chalice was owned by a old king or a mm. mummy lord or something. The dragon will know that and be able to tie some history into that. Mm-hmm. And whenever dragons build up a massive, massive wealth of uh, their hoard from items from all around different planes, they can actually uh, develop this trait, I believe it's called dragon sight, where they can, uh, their brain essentially evolves in such a way that they can know what's happening in other planes and other dimensions, and they can end up finding other versions of themselves based on just the items they have on their mm. in their hoard. Uh, they, they, their hoard makes them more powerful in a, in a strange sense. Yeah. There's a couple of things about layers that I do want to touch on. So, mm-hmm. um, High mountains and hills with geothermal activity are the, the types of locations that are sought after by red dragons due to their natural hazards. So Why like, can't a dragon just live in a nice place, man? Why is it, <laughs> why, they're dangerous enough as it is. You don't need all this extra extra hoops to jump through, man. Just stay yeah. somewhere nice and easy. I mean, that does raise the question, like, what comes first, the red dragon or the geothermic activity? <laughs> you know, like, is it... Does okay, it, first the volcano <laughs> or the dragon, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, as I said, the natural as your hazard. So it's sort of like a defensive position, as you mm-hmm. imagine. They have vast wealth that they want to protect, and you can even imagine like infighting between different um, dragons of the same color or of similar colors. So mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier that copper dragons compete with red dragons for these sorts of locations for their layers. Yeah, and the housing market's horrible for everybody, <laughs> dragons included. You know. Um, What's your favorite uh, favorite kind of dragon fortress or cave or dungeon that's ever been portrayed? And, and this can be in anything. I don't know. Mine was the very first dragon fortress I've ever seen. It's one I would love to run it in an actual D&D campaign sometime. Yeah. Do you remember the movie Shrek? Yes. Do you remember the fortress that's, Princess Fiona's yes. trapped in? That's a good answer. Well, I, I love the idea because they're full of hazard as well. You get the rickety bridge over the yeah. lava to begin with. Then you got all of the crumbling tires. You got the big slide section as well. Remember Shrek sliding mm. down the thing? I was like, that would work really, really well in a D&D set. And I mm. think you could make some really cool little traps about it. But don't tell your players it's Shrek. Let them figure it out themselves. <laughs> <I> <laughs> figure that out. My answer's a lot more simple. It's, do you remember the Red Gyarados <laughs> from Hard Souls? <gasps> Soul yeah, yeah. In Lake... Uh, what was the lake? I forget. Yeah, it was in, big, it was in the middle of a lake. Yeah, it yeah. was the Lake of Rage. Was lake it? of Rage or something. Yeah, like that, yeah, where I just remember like I, I was a kid and I was playing through that. And it was, it was the first time I'd ever seen uh, a shiny Pokemon. It was the first time I'd ever seen a shiny Pokemon. Yeah, I got chills when I said. It was the first time I'd ever seen a shiny Pokemon, and I was so blown away that I, this thing that I knew what it was supposed to look like just looked completely different. And it was just yeah. this. Uh, it was all the atmosphere. I don't actually remember if there was like rain and thunder, but it felt like there was that. That's the thing about those old school video games, though. They're such low resolution and and you know poly kind quality. But in your childlike imagination, it seems so much more epic. Mm. And that actually ties into Dungeons and Dragons quite well. It's all based in your imagination, mm. you know, and uh, it can seem much more epic than it actually is based on you know just how much work you're putting in. And I'm glad you, you, you just you realised that it was a shiny Pokemon and it mm. was a unique thing that happened. Yeah. My first ever one was a Rattata and it was a weird green colour I think it was and I thought my game broke and I panicked <laughs> and I quickly switched it off. It wasn't until years after I realised, oh wait, that was my first ever shiny Pokemon. But I panicked as a kid, I was like, oh no, my game's broke. He's supposed to be pink. What the hell is going on here? Uh, I, I remember um, also when I was a child, I, I killed a shiny Pokemon because I thought it would give more XP. Ah, uh, min maxer, I like it. I like it. I like it. Did it give more XP? Uh, no, it gave you the same amount. I was like, I was like, wait, does that mean it's gone forever? <laughs> Did you get ripped off? <laughs> It was like it was like a worm pull or something. It was some like tiny little like. Bug That's creature. the thing. The shiny Pokemon you're going to find is always going to be in the first, you know, three four routes, and you're yeah. not going to want to use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I like uh, Chinese and Nuzlocke, but I think we're getting distracted. We'll yeah. talk about Pokemon a different day. Uh, so we could talk about all of the dragon Pokemon <laughs> someday. <laughs> that could be cool. Yeah. That could be. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, Pokemon uh, that would make good D and D monsters. Yes, let's do. Yeah, this. and then there's already Minecraft D and D. You may as well be Pokemon D and D. Yes. Well, there's Minecraft everything. There's Minecraft yeah. Pokemon as well. <laughs> there's Minecraft Pokemon. Yeah. Full circle. Let's right. get back to the. Right. Now. So red <laughs> dragons. Um, um, the last two. Big topics I want to talk about is layer actions and regional effects. These are mm. some of my favorite and most evocative um, 
I would say are the most evocative um, abilities. So lair actions are erupting jets of magma, uh, tremors, which are basically like um, like earthquakes, mini earthquakes, mm-hmm. and volcanic gas, which forces con saves. So these are just sort of like um, region, not regional effects are different. They are lair actions. They will impact battle, will impact, uh, and it sort of adds to like the mystique of dragons. Mm-hmm. By having lair actions, they are perceived as being more powerful. Yeah, and, and it's sort of it's more flavorful. It's not just a big bag of hit points. There's yeah. more going on to the fight. Mm. It's not just oh, I hit you with my claw, I hit you with my tail, and I breathe fire on you. It's everything. You're in my. Is that a case of like I'm trapped in here with you? You're trapped in here with me mm. when it comes to the dragon. Uh, and I just call it. They can control every single aspect of it. Um, one of my favorite ways to describe. Whenever players are going into like a dragon lair or a dragon dragon's areas, obviously they have that gaseous smell. I like to describe it as a lot of people will describe it as like molten sulfur type mm-hmm. thing. I like to describe it as axe body spray. You know, the Africa <laughs> one in particular, it just smells like uh, you know how I would imagine a dragon's lair being. Yeah. Yeah, so the last thing we'll talk about for red dragons is regional effects. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is things like earthquake warm sulfur laden water and rocky fissures within a mile of the lair which act as portals to the plane of fire yeah so what does that mean like is that a two-way portal i imagine so yeah so like you get creatures from the fire domain coming into you can just, imagine just, like fire elementals like dragers um, and stuff genies yeah. azer all sorts of um fire elemental you can imagine all the bad shit I mean, you. you could imagine like a, a red dragon taking slaves and selling them to the slavers in the city of Brass or something mm. like that. Like, that could be an entire campaign. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, don't mess with red dragons is what you're saying, essentially. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, um, yeah, that, that red dragons, bread and butter of what D&D is. <laughs> They're terrifying. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about their personality, maybe? Like their uh, ego, how to, how to maybe role play it? Yeah, so we did uh, cover this a little bit. We can go back over it. So they're notoriously covetous. Um, so they tend to be accumulating wealth for the sake of accumulating wealth. Mm. Um, um, they are easily angered, and they're very destructive when they're angered. Um, they see themselves as being superior to all, and they believe that they are Tiamat's chosen. Yeah. So they don't actually have any goal whatsoever other than just they want as much wealth as possible. Yeah. Very, very vain. Yeah. Arguably the most vain of all the dragons. Yeah, money for the sake of money. Yeah. I respect it. Respect it. Red dragons are capitalists. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alright. Move on to White Dragon? Yeah, let's do it. White Dragon's never played a White Dragon before. I have. Um, so I played two White Dragons. Um, I don't remember their names, but I played as a White Dragon Wormling, which was in the. Uh, the, the 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 beginner box, not the starter set, the 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 X the Ice Fire Peak one. The dragon, oh yeah, yeah, dragon yeah. Of Ice Fire Peak. Mm-hmm. And I also ran an ancient white dragon in my Icewind Dale Ryan with the Frost Maiden campaign. Oh. So there was one ice. Was it? It was like a necrotic ice dragon. I think we fought one time mm. in one shot. Like it was a level twenty one shot. Yeah, you're right. There was some. It was a Draco Lich. Yeah, I think it was a white ancient dragon based off of yeah. or something. Yeah, with the Draco Lich subtype. But they just had to make him undead as well because mm. it was more fun. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, I don't have much experience with white dragons. I feel like they're one people sort of pass over a little bit. Yeah, it's just the, the, their environment is mostly Arctic and icy. So they tend to, if, you, if you're having an Arctic campaign, it's going to be featuring white dragons. But if you're not in like cold environments, you're just not going to see ice. You know, mm. white dragons yeah I, I've never really based any of my campaigns off in a colder environment mm. it's involved deserts it's involved mm. oceans it's involved forests arctic ones I, I don't know it's a it's a really interesting environment to play with mm. but uh, not one very like dangerous take very, very deadly I've always loved yetis yetis mm. is one of my favourite monsters to play but I've I've thrown yetis in, in, in the middle of forests and stuff yeah. before just because I want to play them but I'm not in a, in a cold environment which, which is difficult to do with white dragons which I think is why they see very little play is yeah. because like with most of the other chromatic dragons you can imagine how you could justify to yourself you're always going to have a mountain you're always going to have a yeah. forest easy to have a wee bog over here yeah. somewhere where you know, one of the main Whereas well, white dragons, because of their biome, it, it's mm. just more restrictive and who can use them. Yeah, and I think 
that also bases off of our environment as well. We're from, you know, a colder part of the world where it is wet and rainy and, you know, the kind of environment a, a, a white dragon might actually like. Whenever we're playing a game like this, we don't want to imagine ourselves in a cold, wet environment. If we want to imagine that, we'll just go outside. <laughs> we tend to stick to places that are warmer and a bit more magical, you know. So back to my notes. Oh, yeah. So about <laughs> white dragons, yes. No, so there's nothing about why we don't play white dragons. They are the smallest and least intelligent of the chromatic dragons. Oh, well, that's just harsh. Their intelligence score is the lowest of the chromatic dragons. They're still smarter than me, though. That is true. That's not, saying a, whole, that's, that's not saying a whole lot, though. Um, and they're the most animalistic of the chromatic dragons. Mm. So they're driven mostly by hunger and greed. So they're very sort of instinctual and uh, animalistic. Yeah, if a red dragon is a wizard, a white dragon's a barbarian, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, something like yeah. that. Well, I don't know. Would, would, would blue dragon be a wizard? Well, maybe. Well, what would a red dragon be? Warlock. No, rogue. Rogue. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Rogue. Rogue makes sense. Yeah, yeah rogue makes sense. Uh, anyway, <laughs> they're said to be the best hunters of all dragons. So mm-hmm. you can imagine them sort of like slotting into a niche, an ecological niche, mm-hmm. where they do hunt yeti and deer and reindeer and moose and you know that sort of thing with yeah. in their environment. That's cool. That's very cool. I wonder what. Uh, I love the idea of like a white dragon having a group of like yeti cultists. <laughs> Sounds absolutely bloody ridiculous, but I love that idea. Mm. Oh, there's an idea going in my head. Come back to me in a few months' time. I'll have a one shot ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I was reading about white dragons is they actually prefer to eat their prey cold. So either when they kill it with their cold breath, or mm-hmm. if they kill it without the cold breath, they store it in snow. To freeze it so they okay. can later eat it. Yeah, that's a really fun little personality trait for yeah. them, actually. Yeah, is there a, a reason why? Or it's just aesthetic. Just an aesthetic yeah, thing. Yeah, I think so. Like ice pups. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so they, uh, as personality wise, they prefer isolation, uh, and they only meet with other dragons to mate. Which. That new mood. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's still animals at the end of the day, you know. You know, nature's nature's going to nature. Uh, one of my favorite things about D and D monsters is when they can be used as mounts. Mm-hmm. And white dragons are one of the few um, dragons that are in lore being said to be mounts. And in this case, it's by um, ice. I'm sorry, frost giants. Frost giants riding white dragons. That's badass. It, it's really cool. That's badass. It's really cool. Yeah. That's terrifying, but badass. The, the one in... Do you think that's because they w- would be slightly more animalistic? There's a element that makes them easier to be tamed because they are less I intelligent. Think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. They're more... Yeah. They're more... Mm. Um, they're, they're less sort of, you know, like not, like not nihilistic, like selfish and self-centered. Yeah. And they could view themselves... They don't have a certain view of themselves. Mm, they don't view them being better than everything else. No, exactly. So they mm. they can respond with you know like an ice a frost giant would be stronger mm. than a white dragon. So you could understand how it's just a matter of they're stronger, so they're in command. Yeah, and especially if they get the frost dragon at a young wormling age, mm. then yeah, that's uh, it, it's like it's like you know. Small old woman known in Rottweilers. Mm. Obviously, the Rottweiler is a lot stronger, but the the, the Rottweiler respects the the, the, the hierarchy. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I love the idea of uh... dragon mounts have always been fascinating to me, actually. Mm. But um, there's one of them in Fizbins, actually, uh, a range new ranger archetype, mm. Draco Rider or something like that. There, and it starts off level one or two. And the range starts off like a little mini dragon type dude. He can't do much with it. He just goes in and does a wee scratch attack mm. or whatever. But as you level up, the dragon gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's not necessarily as powerful as a real dragon. But it's essentially a, you know, a mini dragon that you get to ride around. And mm. it's just it's so much fun to play. Yeah. And it gives rangers a little bit of a buff in the later levels as well. And I've always wanted to play a character that had a really cool mount. Like not even a Saudi dragon, like a like a pseudo dragon, like a like a wyvern or something could be cool. Yeah, I think um, a lot of DMs shy away from mm. giving players the opportunity for having for having. Uh, I think it's because they don't want to kill them. They don't want to kill the 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 mite or the familiars, and it can make combat that little bit more extra difficult. Mm. I tend to go with the rule: with you can have all the mites and stuff that you want, but you aren't allowed to use them in combat. 
but I'm not allowed to kill them in combat either. So as soon as combat starts, they all just teleport away somewhere magical and they're completely safe. Because yeah. I had a dog die one time and it was just not a nice experience. I felt like a bad guy, you know? Yeah, I am. Um, I was actually considering, I had a character die in a campaign and I was considering playing as a cavalier fighter, which is like a That's cool. fighter. That's it's cool. It's really cool. And I was talking to the DM and like, basically, there just weren't any provisions in the module that would allow for a, a mount. There were no mention of anything that could be used as a mount. Really? Not even a horse? No, because it was it was in the Feywild. Oh, it was in the Feywild. And he yeah. said, like, listen, you had a chance to have a giant slug as a mount in like Fucking at like badass. level two, but <laughs> we ended up not having it, so we just moved on. Mm. You know, we just moved on. So I ended up not playing it. I ended up playing as a, a um, was it a warlock or something? I don't, I don't even remember. I fucking Drew. love the idea of a big giant slug as a yeah. mount. Charge! <laughs> I'll get you the next three to five working days. <laughs> There's a, there's a really cool feat as well in the player handbook for, for mounted mm. combat as well, isn't there? Where you get like, like buffs when you're mounted and it's hard to knock you off your, your horse. Yeah, around. I've never, I've, it's one of those, I've always glanced over it and be like, that'd be awesome to play if I ever played that kind of character, yeah. but I've never played that kind of character before. Yeah. Well, so you have to like be reasonable, like is it really, is it reasonable for you to have a wyvern as a mount when you're doing like a dungeon crawl? Mm. You know, it's just like, it's not going to fit. Yeah, it's just not going to fit. <laughs> <laughs> It's not gonna fit, you know. No, that makes sense. We should probably get back to White Dragons. Oh yeah, yeah, White Dragons, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um they're uh, as far as like what they hoard, coins and gems, especially diamonds, makes mm-hmm. sense. They litter the floor in a white dragon's lair, but they are encased in ice. <gasps> oh that's cool. So they're that's having, cool. they're all at different layers. So if you if you broke if you killed a white dragon, it would take you days to access their hoard because it's all encased in different layers of ice. God, that sounds so annoying. Yeah, I have my players um, in my Icewind Dale campaign. They found like a it wasn't an entire hoard of a white dragon, but it was a partial hoard, mm. and they were like burning. They were using like torchlight and like fire cantrips to like melt the ice. Mm. But every time that they they spent an hour there, I rolled a die, and there was a twenty percent chance this like dragon would reappear. God, um, that's so annoying you get you kill the dragon you want the gold you want the hoard and then it's locked away yeah but it's a clever way of like keeping it locked up i suppose mm. that sounds quite aesthetically beautiful as well i love the idea of like walking on the floor and then it's just mm. listening with the jewels yeah. and gold and you can like walk through like a like a like, a, uh, like an arch mm. and there's like gold shimmering all around you yeah that like, was a light coming that sounds really really pretty yeah it's really really pretty much nicer than just some you know, red dragons, stinky cave that stinks yeah. of Axe body spray. You know, <laughs> if a red dragon smells of Axe body spray, a, a, a frost dragon, white dragon probably smells like peppermint or spearmint or something. You know, hmm. yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I like I like I like talking about the smells of creatures and stuff because uh, it is smells one of our most important senses. You know, you get sight, you get sounds, you can describe what you see, you can describe what you hear, you can describe what you feel, mm-hmm. but you never describe what you smell. And the smell of something can be really, really interesting way of describing something. It's really evocative. No, I think a white dragon would smell like Cool Breeze, Wrigley's Cool Breeze chewing gum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had it in my head that they would smell like blood. Blood? Yeah. What, like an iron metallic kind yeah. of smell? Yeah. yeah. I couldn't tell you what blood actually smells like. No, I'm just sort of getting the impression that if you imagine like a really frigid cold where like your blood vessels and your nose are all like oh, yeah. up, yeah. you sort of like smell. Oh, you're going to the sciencey stuff? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Anyway, so we're getting really <laughs> distracted. <from it. laughs> we, will give, like, we just really like white dragons, no, we just right? Really we just like really like white dragons. Dragons are so cool. They smell minty fresh. Um, so they're hard to bribe because they, as far as they're concerned, they would rather just kill you and take the treasure and eat you. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Very simple. Their um, layer actions are a freezing fog, a falling ice shard, and a wall of ice. Just sort of like crowd control, mm-hmm. um, battlefield control. You can just imagine it. You also know. in a frost dungeon. It just makes sense. You're gonna have icicles. Yeah, you know, it just it makes sense. Like it's in every movie ever that's in a cave and in a frost environment. The icicles are gonna kill you. Are gonna do something anyway. And their regional effects are fog, blizzards, and icy walls. Icy walls. So you can sort yeah. of just imagine that. It, uh, it all sort of makes sense. You can mm. see that they're. You know, we mentioned before in this podcast, but the dragons are innately magical, and their effect on the region will warp it. 
Mm. You know. So a frost dragon will go to a cold environment or they will make the environment around them cold? As far as I can tell, they they're I think it's not the either of those things, it's just that they're adapted for cold environments. Mm. So I mean I think we're getting into the evolution of dragons, and that's not something I prepared. But <laughs> well, it's the same thing with the red dragons. Like, what came first, the volcano yeah, or the red dragon? <laughs> exactly. So, what came first, the ice, the icy environment, or the, the white mm. dragon? So, probably the icy environment. The white yeah, dragon, I don't so. so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So that's all my notes for the core chromatic dragons. The mm-hmm. only other things I have notes on is uh, Tiamat herself. Yes, I'll Tiamat. I'm pretty sure Tiamat's something that everybody in Everybody's played a little bit of Dungeons Dragons, at least has at least heard of Tiamat, yeah. but what is Tiamat? So Tiamat is a god of the chromatic dragons. It's a five-headed progenitor of all chromatic dragons, mm. and the five heads are the five main colors of chromatic dragons, so yeah. red, green, blue, white, black. Yeah, and Tiamat isn't just necessarily a god of all chromatic dragons, he is... And a lot of the the D and D settings, you know, like Dragonlance and stuff, Tiamat, along with her her chromatic counterpart, or uh, yeah, chromatic counterpart, um, Bahamut, I believe you pronounce mm-hmm. his name is, she, or the metallic counterpart. Yeah, they were like the good and evil forces that actually created the 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 world. You know, they 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 were the reason that the world came to exist. Uh, at least in, 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 in that particular amount anyway. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Tiamat is, is, is sort of like the all-encompassing force of evil, and chaos, and destruction. And, yeah, just an all right, not a nice, not a nice person. I was going through a lot of the uh, uh, stuff on Tiamat, actually, trying to find like a stat block for Tiamat, at least in 5e. Tiamat's so powerful... You can't even find a stat block for Tiamat. You mm-hmm. can find a stat block for an aspect of Tiamat, yeah. which is not Tiamat. Yeah. It's an aspect of Tiamat. It's like yeah. Tiamat's shadow. Yeah. She's that powerful, you know? Yeah. You're like, you don't even get to fight the real thing, you know? You can't fight the real thing. It kind of reminds me of, there's this concept in Magic the Gathering where they have these sort of like flying spaghetti monster type um, bad guys called the Eldrazi. Mm. And they're... Um, some they're some of the most powerful creatures, some of the biggest stats, most powerful abilities, but they're said to just be like aspects of sort of like like a finger poking through into the mm. world, and this like little appendage of this greater entity is some of the most powerful thing you've ever seen. Yeah, you know, and it's in the lore and it's reflected in the mm. mechanics, and you sort of get that with Tiamat, where she is uh, so so powerful that a form of her, something taking image in mm. her. Um, is so powerful level like CR thirty. It's the mm. highest CR in five E. There's very few things that actually are CR uh, CR thirty. There's like some great worms. I think the only other CR thirty, at least I found, is the opposite of Bahamut or the opposite team is the aspect of Bahamut. Yeah, I think uh, Tarasks are also CR thirty. Are they? And I think um, I think I, I'm, I'm not sure. I can look it up. But, um, and uh, Great Worms, some Great Worms are mm. like really high CR. Yeah, yeah, Great Worms are terrifying. Um, yeah, and I love that idea of something that's so powerful, you cannot put its true power into a stat block, or you can't even fathom its, it, 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 its real true power. And do you know what my mind keeps on going to? It keeps on going to the Shaggy meme. Of I'm only using one percent. You know Shaggy from uh, Scooby Doo. Oh, okay. I thought you were on about it wasn't me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It was like there's a lot of memes going on about Shaggy from Scooby Doo, where Shaggy's this like omnipotent godlike being and he only ever uses one percent. In fact, it's got him fighting the ball fell out of One Punch Man. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I've not seen the anime, but apparently One Punch Man can kill anything in one punch. Shaggy beats him only using one percent of his power. Mm-hmm. I love I love the idea of something being that. Powerful, you can even fathom it, you know. And that's kind of what Tiamat is. Tiamat is like the shaggy memes. Yeah, I did look it up. Terrasks are CR30. Are they? Yeah. Good, I'm not fighting one of those then. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, there's two presentations of Tiamat in 5e. The first one was from the Rise of Tiamat Adventure, which mm. I haven't ran, but I have read. Um, and then what level is that adventure? Yeah, uh, it's like a two-part adventure that mm. they originally p- published. Is like 
I guess the Cult of the Dragon Queen or something like that, and mm. then, uh, Rise of Tiamat, and they were both two halves of the same adventure. And then they republished it as just Rise of Tiamat, but I've only read it, I haven't played it, so I don't mm. know. But um, the uh, the presentation in Fizzbow's Treasury of Dragons is really interesting. It has this like two-phased fight, where the second, so the first time you beat Tiamat, if you ever manage to beat the aspect of Tiamat, the, the form will fade, and then it will reappear with full hit points, and now having additional mythic actions, mm. the amount of mythic action is, it's just another thing that they've tagged on to make her even more powerful. Yeah, yeah, I was having a look at the stat buttons, same with a lot of great worms as well, it's mm. like, oh yeah, you killed it, good for you, they're now back at full health yeah. again, it's that they're... Very typical thing like Dark Souls likes to do is like, oh, you kill the boss. And you're like, oh, happy days. Wait, the music's not ended yet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, another health bar appears. You're like, God, I'm not going to do this again. It's going to be even harder. Um, but uh, these are supposed to be godlike beings. You know, a, a, a grip of level 20 adventures are sort of like demigods in their own right. Yeah. So they need a challenge that, that is going to be that difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's supposed to be an impossible challenge. It's yeah. supposed to feel impossible, you know. Like, well, so the whole idea of the CR rating is that a party of um, characters leveled equal to that CR should be able to have a moderately good time against them. And the highest level you can get to in 5th edition is 20th level. And these monsters are just the earth. The earth mm, yeah. So you have to imagine that you would have to be like min max, godly to your equipment. Um, really well prepared you have good strategy you have lots of minions you're summoning lots of assistance mm. you're calling in favors from like all your allies it's the kind of thing you're gonna need to do it with a group of experienced players who know what they're doing mm -hmm. who have then at level 20 you're able to do an awful lot yeah. you're and if you really look and break in the nitty gritty of uh, what a lot of classes can do you can make some broken stuff you mm. know hello monks um, so it's not like it's impossible, but you're not going to be able to throw this at people who've just been playing D and D for a couple of weeks. You know, it needs to be for. I've been playing for years. I don't even think I would be able to do a team at like like be able to take. Okay, so here, here's an interesting thought experiment. You have to design a party to take down an aspect of team at. Mm -hmm. What is your tactic? Oh, I would need to sit and think about it for okay. for a while. I can tell you mine. Okay. So I thought about this. What you get is four fighters. You're trained in archery with magical bows mm -hmm. and put them on flying carpets. Why is flying carpets always involved in breaking down <laughs> big bosses? <laughs> it's like the, the like Tiana can only move so fast, she can only like focus her breath attacks on mm. one particular area at a time. Just have them constantly moving, constantly out of range, picking her off from a distance. Mm. As long as you have magical attacks, as long as you're chipping away at her, eventually you'll beat her. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a big problem with a lot of players is they don't play well as a team. Or not that they don't play well as a team, but they don't understand how to split up. And it's something that I've encountered a few times now in my in, in my main campaign is we're all just gripped up all the fucking time and we never split up. And I'm like, as a player, you don't want the meta game. Yeah. But like, I'll, my character will like run off to the side to try and get out of it. And then they'll all get hit by a big massive breath attack or fireball. I'm like... It's, it's a good piece of advice for new players. Don't mm. split the party. Mm. But once you're experienced enough, sometimes splitting the party is correct. Oh, I don't even mean like split the party. I just mean we'll go to different parts of the room so we're not all grouped together. <laughs> is what you. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, just, just let's all not bunch up so one fireball will kill us all. Mm -hmm. um, oh, but like a, a genuine tactic to take out Tiamat... I would need to sit and think about it for a while. I want to try and come up with the one that's that's fun and not... Cheesy. Cheesy. Yeah. Yours is yours is yours is like. I, I've actually heard another one, but I'll just share now. Uh, so this is not my thinking. Um, what you do is you just mag you find a way to teleport her to the plane of water and wait for her to suffocate. Uh, I've heard of that before. That, yeah. yeah, I've had a player or two teleport to the mm. fall into a puddle one time, and they got teleported to the plane of water. <laughs> <laughs> that was a whole other thing. Um, yeah, but. Surely Tiamat can just fly out of the but water? In, in the plane of water... Oh, it's just all it's water? All it's all water? It's all water? It's all water, water. It's water oh. all the way down. Oh, I'm imagining like that planet out of uh, Interstellar. Okay. Where it's like just a planet and it's just one big bubble of ocean type thing. Okay. So there's no... It's all just water in the plane of yeah, water? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, that sounds way less fun. So I can't do a pirate adventure on the plane of water? 
You could do a submarine pirate adventure. That sounds way better, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, change my mind. Change my mind. Um, yeah, I'll come up with a strat to beat Tiamat okay. at some stage, I think. Um, we'll talk about it another week. Yeah, we're going to have a podcast dedicated to how we'll take down the toughest monsters. Good day. Yeah. I always like the idea of taking down a Tarrasque by... We have one person hold a rope that side, the other person hold a rope that side, and we just trip it up like the Ewoks done against the, <laughs> the like AT-ATs. The AT-ATs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I love the idea of a bunch of Ewoks taking down a Tarrasque. Let's go, let's go. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to touch on with, uh, with Tiamat then, do you think? Or? That's pretty much... Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Uh, I think we've done pretty well with talking about dragons, but... Obviously, we've only scratched the surface yeah. with them, really. There's a lot to continue talking about. We've got chromatic dragons. we got the gem dragons that just came out. Yeah. We've got the whole life cycle of dragons. We haven't even touched on dragon mating rituals. Believe it or not, there's a whole section out on Fizzbands. It's got like three pages dedicated to it. It's really, really interesting. It's dragon smut. It is dragon <laughs> smut. It's complete and, dra- it's complete and total dragon smut. How, how to play dragons and stuff. So we've just kind of scratched the surface of dragons in this one, but... There's not much to talk about with them, you know. Yeah. They are the poster boys of D and D. You know, they are the second D in D and D. Yeah. So I think next week we're going to be talking about uh, some of our favourite low-level monsters. Yeah, we're going to come up with five or six of our favourite low-level ones. How we like to play them. Uh, some of the most interesting ones we throw at, you know, young parties that are going off on their first adventure. What group of fun enemies can we throw with them to 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 make them realise their mortality? So maybe um, in the comments, leave a comment just saying what your favorite low-level monster is. Maybe something around... No, do that level. next week. This this week, leave a comment on your favorite dragons. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or your, What's your favorite color of chromatic dragon? Or or even just a comment about an amazing experience you had with a chromatic dragon or, okay. or, or any, any... Just leave a comment about cool experiences or favorite dragons or something like that there, you know. And come back next week for uh, our low-level monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Leave a like, share, 